Welcome to the channel and welcome to my review of Codex Imperial Knights. This is an army book for Games of Warhammer 40k 8th edition and is available for pre-order on Saturday the 2nd of June and you can buy it from Games Workshop from Saturday the 9th of June and oh mama, it's a good one. Let's dive straight in because oh, before we start, thank you to Games Workshop for sending it through to me so that I can review it and get the information out there for the community for us all to digest. So let's dive straight in because we've got new models new toys, four pages of stratagems, four pages of relics. It's a good one. So let's jump straight in and talk about the new knights because there's a new class of knights. We've got the armager class, which we saw in Forgebane. Um, we've got the Questorus class of knights, which are the ones that we're familiar with, Knight Paladins, Knight Errants, Knight Crusaders. But there are two new knights, which are Dominus class knights. These are Knight Castellans and Knight Valiant. These guys are expensive. Talking about points, we'll get to that at the end, but uh, the points values for, for all of these models has gone down, and in some cases quite significantly. Um, so the Knight Castellan, which is on your screen now, is a big bad tank of a knight, Dominus class knight, and then the Knight Valiant, which is on your screen now, is a big bad class, Dominus class, brutal stuff. Um, I'm going to do a more in-depth review on the Knight Valiant because uh, I've got the model and it should be going up at the same time as this review here, talking exactly through what the Knight Valiant does and just how brutal the thing is. Uh, so let's go back to the Knight Castellan, which is on your screen now. And as you can see, it's got all the guns. Those two cannons on its right and left shoulder are twin siege breaker cannons which are 48 inch range heavy 2d3 strength 7 minus 1 ap d3 damage each so only strength 7 minus 1 only but uh, that would be 4 d3 shots at 48 inch range minus 1 d3 damage each and it's got these two rockets on its shoulder now these rockets are shield breaker rockets they are one shot only at strength 10 minus 4 ap d6 damage each doesn't sound entirely brilliant, does it? I mean, it's good. Strength 10, minus 4 AP, D6 damage each is, is brutal. But one shot each, not so great. However, there is a stratagem that you can get to when firing shield breaker rockets. It is, um, where are we? It is a two-point stratagem, and it's called Oath Breaker Guidance Systems. Use this stratagem before choosing a target for a shield breaker missile in your shooting phase. So let's say you're firing both of these missiles off, but you can only use this stratagem for one shield breaker missile in your shooting phase. That shield breaker missile can target a unit that is not visible to the bearer and can target characters, even if it is not the closest model. So these one-shot missiles can hit anything on the battlefield 48 inch range, regardless of whether they're visible or not. If you spend this two point stratagem, you can target a unit that's not visible to the bearer and you can shoot a character. So you could point it at Gulliman, if you're being a traitor, <laughs> or point it at Magnus, or point it at the enemy warlord who's at the back there and basically snipe him out with a D6 AP minus four missile. Now you're thinking, well, that doesn't matter. My guy has got an invulnerable save, but shield breaker missiles, all shield breaker missiles have this rule. Each shield breaker missile can only be fired once per battle and a model can only fire one each turn. Invulnerable saving throws cannot be made against wounds caused by this weapon. You don't get an invulnerable save. So actually, that's a good point. I said fire both off in the same turn. You can't. You fire off one per turn each turn. And you don't take invulnerable saves at it. And for two command points, you can pick on a character and do d6 damage, ignoring their invulnerable saves, because you can't take invulnerable saves against wounds caused by this weapon. Shield breaker missiles. Brutal stuff. Um, only fire one each turn. I like it. Anyway, let's talk about the big guns that are on its right and left arm. Um, we'll just gloss over the fact that it's got two twin melt guns, so four melter shots in each of its shoulders. So we know what melt guns do. Strength 8 minus 4 AP, D6 damage each at 12 inch range. Nasty. But in its right arm, it has a plasma decimator, which is a 48 inch range gun. It does one damage. It's strength 7 minus 3 AP, one damage. But it is heavy 2D6. Or you can overcharge it just like any other plasma weaponry and make it strength 8 minus 3 AP, 2 damage each. 
and then for each hit roll of a 1 the bearer suffers 1 mortal wound after all of these shots have been resolved. So strength 8 minus 3 AP 2 damages is fruity, but it gets better. If you want to give the Plasma Decimator one of the relics, just flicking to it, called Call's Wrath. Um, and you might want to give it this, bear in mind some of these re relics are really, really good. But this one is really, really good. Um, Cool's Wrath standard, without overcharging, is strength 8, minus 4 AP, 2 damage. Now, that's a Hellblaster profile overcharged, without causing any mortal wounds to yourself. 2d6 shots, strength 8, minus 4 AP, 2 damage. And we know what Hellblasters do. That's absolutely brutal and then if you do overcharge it you get it to strength 9 minus 4 AP 3 damage and you'll be doing mortal wounds to hit rolls on one on yourself but there really is no need to if you're doing strength 8 minus 4 AP 2 damage each without overcharging that's a, a nice relic that's the gun in its right hand the gun in its left hand is a volcano lance and has an 80 inch range so there is really no hiding from this it is only a heavy d6 shot i say only heavy d6 because you might roll a one to hit and only get one shot out there but if you do roll the big bad six this thing is going to bruise because it's strength 14 it is minus three minus five ap so you will only really be taking invulnerable saves against it and it is 3d3 damage, and you can re-roll failed wound rolls when targeting titanic units with this weapon. So at strength 14, minus 5, 3d3, it's going to be stinging some wraith knights or other titanic units out there. The knight Castellan, it has all the guns, it's Dominus class, it's base of its model uh, base unit cost is something like 500 points or something 510 points before you add on all the guns so you can imagine that once you've added all the guns onto this guy he's a bit of a beefcake so both of the dominus class knights the castellan and the valiant have the same stat line as the normal lights uh, normal knight strength eight toughness eight four attacks leadership nine three up save five up and vulnerable save however they've got 28 wounds instead of 24 wounds Four more wounds, so they can hang in there a bit longer. And because both of these models carry enough guns to make the Tau blush, they don't have an option to swap out one of those guns for a Reaper Chainsword or a Punchy Fist. So um, in close combat, you're going to have to rely on the Titanic Feet, and it has the normal Titanic Feet rule. So instead of making four attacks, it's going to make 12 attacks at strength 8 with its feet, minus 2 damage, D uh, minus 2 AP, D3 damage each. They've also got dual plasma core explosions, so when they go boom, they go boom. If this model is reduced to zero wounds, roll 2d6 before removing it from the battlefield. And if you roll a six on either dice, it explodes. And each unit within 2d6 suffers d6 mortal wounds, so more of a chance of it going boom. If you roll six on both of those dice to see if it explodes, each unit within 3d6 suffers d6 mortal wounds instead big bada boom so those are the dominus class ones there is another new model called canis rex he's a named free blade uh, character that you can bring in your army he's up on the screen now and uh, when this model dies basically when the imperial knight goes down if he doesn't blow up you can get sir hector out within three inches of canis rex and the model isn't considered uh, destroyed until Sir Hector himself has been destroyed. So he jumps out. And when he jumps out and runs around, he's a character. And he's got a pistol in his hand, which is strength 5, minus 2 AP, 2 damage. And he'll run around all over the place doing his thing. Now, Sir Hector has a Laz Impulsor in his right fist. And Frieden's hand, this Thunderstrike Gauntlet in his left fist before we go on to the other rules there is a new um questorus class knight as well so as well as your paladins your errants your crusaders there's a knight preceptor as well in this book a new way of loading up your imperial knight and the knight preceptors come with this laz impulsor this big gun that you can see in the right hand there um and uh, so a knight preceptor, so say you'd normally run in a, a knight paladin, instead of running a knight paladin, you could bring along a knight preceptor. And it has this Laz Impulsor. 
in its right fist and it's got two profiles one is a 36 inch range heavy 2d6 strength 6 minus 2 ap d3 damage so that's your horde killer your primary space marine killer your uh, death guard killer here's strength 6 but it does do minus 2 at d3 damage each every and heavy 2d6 shots long range or you can focus it at high intensity which is OT, only 18 inch range um, and drops the heavy 2d6 down to heavy d6 Again, so if you roll a one, it's a bit, it's it's sad panda time, but if you roll the nice six, getting six shots at 18 inch range is pretty cool. And it is strength 12, and it's minus four AP, and it is D6 damage at time. Right, Canis Rex has got a weapon skill and ballistic skill of two up, the guy on your screen. Um, so he does hit on twos when he shoots stuff with his Laz and Pulsar. And he does punch stuff on threes. Why is he punching stuff on threes? Because he's got a weapon skill of two up. Well, because he's got a big Thunderstrike Gauntlet in your hand. And the Thunderstrike Gauntlet still um, is minus one to hit when you punch stuff with a Thunderstrike Gauntlet. When attacking with this weapon, you must subtract one from the hit roll. So normal Imperial Knights hit on fours. Um, Canis Rex hits on threes because he would normally hit on twos. And... Thunderstrike's Gormlets are, you double the strength to strength 16, minus 4 AP, and they normally do 6 damage each. But the Freedom's Hand does 2 D D6 damage each, minimum 6. So he's always doing 6, just like a Thunderstrike Gauntlet, but you could do 7 to 12. Um, basically, you roll 2 D6, and if you roll double ones, it says, uh, treat any damage rolls less than 6 from this weapon as six and stacked. So if you roll double ones, you're always doing the six damage of a Thunderstrike Gauntlet, but you could be doing a lot more. And you're thinking, why on earth would I take Canis Rex? Why on earth would I ever take anything with a Thunderstrike Gauntlet because it's minus one to hit, it hits on fours? Well, there is a two point stratagem. Um, sorry, there's a one point stratagem called Death Grip. This is one point. Um, use this stratagem immediately after fighting with an Imperial Knights model from your army that is equipped with a Thunderstrike Gauntlet, a, Bar a Paragon Gauntlet of Freedom's Hand, like, um, like Canis Rex here. Roll an additional attack, and if you hit, you get D3 damage. Um, you can only do this to an enemy unit within one inch that consists of a single model. So, I don't know, Gulliman, or the enemy Warlord, or something nasty typhus something nasty and gribbly the swarm lord you smack him if you hit him you'll do d3 mortal wounds not just d3 damage sorry d3 mortal wounds for one command point at the end of your fight phase that's pretty nice but it doesn't end there so if the attack hits the enemy model suffers d3 mortal wounds instead of the normal damage and is caught in a death grip one point command point stratagem death grip then both players roll off and add their respective strength model's strength characteristic to the result. Now it does specify your model's respective strength characteristic, not the weapon characteristic. And the strength characteristic of an Imperial Knight is 8. And the strength characteristic of, I don't know, a Hive Tyrant is 6. So you roll a dice, you add your 8, they add their 6 or whatever their strength characteristic. So it's just a captain, a normal captain um, that you're punching with a strength characteristic of 4. Now, the enemy is trying to struggle out the death grip. So if the opponent rolls equal, re opponent's result equals or exceed yours, the enemy breaks free and nothing happens. And otherwise, if you exceed the enemy's result, they suffer an additional D3 mortal wounds. So you've got a Thunderstrike Gauntlet, you've grabbed someone in the death grip, um, and all you need to do is hit them or with Canis Rex's freedom's hand all you need to do is, is hit them and he hits them three instead of a four you've already done d3 mortal wounds to this captain or to a hive tyrant or something that you really want to kill you both roll off you both add your strength and if you beat his you do another d3 mortal wounds so that's two d3 mortal wounds and it doesn't end there you continue to roll off again and again and again until either the enemy breaks free, equals or exceeds your rolls, or until you kill it. One command point. Nasty. Armager Warglaives. Uh, we're familiar with the Armager Warglaive from Forgebane. In case you're not, it's a strength 6, toughness 7, 12, wound 
four attacks, leadership eight, three up save dude, and he runs around with an ion shield, so he's got a five up invulnerable save, and because he's got 12 wounds, he does degrade. Um, the uh, weapon skill and ballistic skill of this guy does go down, but he's very, very quick. He's perky. He jumps around. He's got a 14-inch move range. And uh, his weapons, the thermal spear is an assault gun, so it's an assault D3, so he can move and fire his guns without the... Uh, Penalty for moving and firing his guns. Remember, your big Imperial Knights have the Titanic keyword, so they can move around and fire their Imperial guns without... Fire their Imperial guns? Their heavy guns without the uh, negative. The Armager Warglaive, though, well, used to be over 240 points, but now the Thermal Spear and the Reaper Chain Cleaver are zero points in the back of the book. So the Armager Warglaive is 130, 160 points. 160 points and you're not paying for the big guns. The only upgrade you'll be paying for is the heavy heavy stubber or the melt gun. And you're going to be taking the melt gun at 17 points. So uh, he's 177 points now, which is a crazy reduction in points costs. I don't think he was very viable before, but now I'm going to field all four of the ones that I've got. And there is now an armager, Helvin. Hel Helverin. He's on the screen now and I think he looks pretty. Two guns. Um, he's got these Armager Auto Cannons, and he's got two of them, the Armager Auto Cannons, as well as the gun on this carapace. And the Armager Auto Cannons are a heavy 2d3 gun, so this guy fires 4d3 uh, times, and he's strength 7, minus 1 AP, 3 damage each. Now it's heavy, but he's got a rule, ignore the penalty to hit rolls for moving and firing this heavy weapon. And he's perky too. He just jumps around 14 inch range. The same base stat line of an armager warglaive. So he's quick. He's firing out 4d3 shots at 60 inch range. Strength 7, minus 1 AP, 3 damage. And like the warglaive, the armager Helverin, well, you don't have to pay for those auto cannons either. He's 170 points base. So you've got 170 points base for something that chucks out a lot of shots at a 60 inch range. And he's your flyer killer because he's got a one command point stratagem called Sky Reaper Protocols. Um, basically, when you are making a, uh, your attacks, when you shoot at something that can fly, until the end of the phase, you can reroll failed hit rolls for that Armager Helverin's uh, Armager Auto Cannons against that enemy unit. Um, so yeah, you don't even have to standing still. He can move and shoot at fly things, re-rolling to hit. Um, and they just look good. I like him. He's got guns, lots of guns. He reminds me of a Rifle Dread. I think he'll function in a very similar manner to a Rifle Dread, because he's Toughness 7, just like a Dreadnought. But he has got 12 wounds with a 5 up and vulnerable save, so he'll probably last a bit longer. And I think the Rifle Dread from the Forge World book... Uh, the one with the two twin auto cannons is 141 points. So bringing this guy along with a stubber, 174 points, on a on and getting four more wounds and uh, having that invulnerable save, I think it's 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 on the money. It's on the it's on the right price point. Talking about points, um, the chassis for a Knight Crusader, Errant, Gallant, Paladin and Warden used to be 320 points in the index. They're now 285 points, so that's a drop of uh, 35 points, which is nice. And the Avenger Gatling Cannon on the Crusader, I think it is, has gone down 20 points. Your Rapid Fire Battle Cannon is still the same. Your Thermal Cannon is still the same. And your twin Icarus Auto Cannon is still the same. The other guns essentially are still the same. Points, Reaper Chain Stored, still the same. Thunderstrike Gauntlet, still the same. So um, you drop in 35 points from most of your knights. And if you bring in the one with the Avenger Gatling Cannon, you drop in an extra 20 odd points, which suddenly makes him pretty viable. Um, Storm Spear Rocket Pod coming in at 45. Um, it used to come in at 45 points, but there's a relic for that one as well. So the Storm Spear is a three-shot missile launcher, essentially. Strength 8, AP minus 2, D6 damage, three shots. Uh, the relic gets that up to AP minus 3, and you can re-roll re failed hit rolls for this weapon. That's a nice relic. Uh, another nice relic is the Endless Fury. So if you're bringing that Avenger Gatling Cannon along, which we said was cheaper... Uh, the Endless Fury, instead of being a heavy 12 weapon at strength 6, minus 2 AP, 2 damage, becomes a heavy 14. 
weapon, 14 shots, strength 6, AP minus 2, 2 damage, nice. And each unmodified hit roll, unmodified hit roll of a 6 made with this weapon scores 2 hits instead of 1. So 14 shots and 6s get you 2 hits, you could get a lot of hits with that thing. So the Night Crusader comes in at 400 points with a Reaper Chain Fist, that's before you add on the Flamer and the Stubbers. And the Flamer and the Stubbers are the same points cost before. So for example, Night Crusaders, Night Paladins, things like that are just going to cost just north of 400 points, something like 420, 430 when you add it all on. And they used to cost just under 500, now they're just over 400. The Dominus class stuff, the Knight Valiant and the Knight Castellan, these guys, well, they they have got a base value of 500 points or 510, and then you add on the guns. Now, the big guns on their right and left fists are free, but uh, then you're p paying for shield breaking missiles, which are 12 points of pop, and the twin siege breaker cannon, which is 35 points of pop. That's the big thing on its carapace. You're paying for the... Um, the twin melt guns are free though. Uh, so these big bad boys, the uh, Dominus class guns, they're coming in somewhere around 550 to 570, depending on what you load them up with. Um, so those are the points costs. Those are the big new toys that you can get. The armagers are back on the menu, boys, because they're not stupid expensive anymore. And Canis Rex is very interesting as a character, running around all over the place. Now he's a free blade. Free blades get rules. They get advantages and disadvantages, and the knights function in certain ways. Free blade qualities and burdens, they're called. So you can pick a free blade, and um, then you get a couple of qualities with it. You get a couple of burdens with it. Because um, they don't benefit from the household stuff. And essentially, when you pick a uh, knight castellan, not knight castellan, but uh, when you pick Imperial Knight Lances, if your army is Battleforged, then essentially um, you choose whether they follow the Imperium, whether they're bonded to the Imperium, whether they get their Questorus, Questor Imperialis um, household traditions, or whether they get the Questor Mechanicus household traditions, whether they're bonded to the Mechanicum or whether they're bonded to the Imperium. And then you pick which tradition they follow. These are like chapter traits. If you're not picking one of these things, and or if your army isn't battleforged, you can pick a free blade, burdens, and thingy bobs. We'll go into that, the free blade stuff, in a bit. Let's talk about the traditions. Um, I should mention um, that because you have to swap out the um, quest or allegiance keyword for either Questor Mechanicus or Questor Imperialis because it states you have to do that um, these because you have to do that if you're bringing Renegade Knights and attaching them to Chaos Warbands then they have to have a Questor Allegiance they have to be Imperialis or Mechanicus so uh, Chaos players this book is not for you you still need to get the data sheet from the in index and use that one instead um, unless you really want to run around a Chaos Warband and chuck in it something with an Imperium keyword or a, a Mechanicus keyword. Um, so that's what you do. And once you've picked your tradition, whether you're Imperium or whether you're Mechanicum, then you pick your tradition within the Imperium and within the Mechanicum. And there are um, five in the Imperium, four in the Mechanicum, and the five in the Imperium go like this. House Terran. They're gallant warriors. I like House Terran. They featured quite heavily in the Horus Heresy and the the, the Mechanicus book. The It's a great book. Anyway. Uh, they, when determined the distance that a unit with this household tradition advances or charges, roll an additional d6 and discard the lowest result. Basically, when you're charging, roll 3d6, chuck the lowest dice. Um, so these guys are charging. Uh, they're more likely to charge re reliably and when they advance, they're 2d6 and chuck the lower. So you're quite speedy. House Griffith, glory of the charge. Add one to the attack's characteristic of a model with this household tradition during any turn when it charged, performed a heroic intervention. Uh, in addition, any model with this household tradition can perform a heroic intervention as if it were a character. So they like getting punchy, adding one to the attacks. Hawk Shroud, Oath Keepers. 
Um, they double the number of wounds they have remaining for the purposes of determining what characteristics they use on their damage table. So I think this is going to be the go-to for most people, if particularly if you're running an Imperial Knight list. Um, doubling the number of wounds you have remaining for the purposes of determining what characteristics you use on your damage table is brutal. There's an Eldar one that works like that. And now you've got it for Imperial Knights. It means that you're more shooty, more punchy, more reliably hitting stuff every turn with every single one of your models when they're injured. House Cadmus, Hunters of the Foe. Reroll wound rolls of one in the fight phase for attacks made by models against units which contain wounds characteristics of 12 or less. Bear in mind that when you're stompy stomping stuff, most cases you're uh, wounding on a 2 because your titanic feet are strength 8 and you're stomping all over units. So you'll be wounding on a 2, re-rolling 1s in the fight phase. So House Cadmus really like dancing on the bones of their enemies. And House Mortan, close quarter killers, add one to hit rolls um, for attacks made by a model with this household tradition during any turn when it was charged, was charged, or provoned, performed a heroic intervention. Um, so the one that stands out in the Questor Imperialis household traditions is Hawk Shroud. That's uh, doubling the number of wounds they have remaining for the purposes of determining what characteristics to use in their damage table. I can see people bringing that a lot. Questor Mechanicus, there's four of these household traditions if you want to bond yourself to the Mechanicus. And you've got House Raven. Models with this household tradition do not suffer the penalties for their hit rolls for advancing and firing assault weapons. Furthermore, during a turn which a unit with this household tradition advances, all of its heavy weapons are treated as assault weapons, e.g. heavy three weapons is treated as an assault three weapon. Tyrannus, the Omnissiah's Grace. Uh, basically, you roll a six every time a model loses a wound, and on a six, the wound is not lost. Uh, Iron Hands chapter tactics kicking in there for Imperial Knights. That one is quite good, because it's hard to wound an Imperial Knight with most conventional weaponry, and this will make it even harder. House Crass, Cold Fury, you can re-roll failed hit rolls in the fight phase for a model with this tradition. During any turn where it was charged, was charged, heroic intervention. In addition, you can re-roll all failed hit rolls in the fight phase for a model with this tradition against Titanic units. So basically, you can re-roll hits when you charge, and if you're not charging against a Titanic unit, or you're already locked up in combat with a Titanic unit, you're re-rolling all hit rolls all the time. And then House Bulker. Firestorm Protocols. Reroll hit rolls of one for a model with this household tradition whenever you're resolving an attack with a ranged weapon that is targeting the closest enemy unit. So I think we've got two standout ones there. The ignoring wounds or the doubling the wounds characteristics for the purposes of damage. But there's a couple of punchy punchy ones in there as well which are going to be very interesting to see. To benefit from a household tradition, if your army is battleforged, all units in an Imperial Knight Super Heavy Detachment, other than Free Braid units, must be from the same household. They will all gain a household tradition, with the exception of Free Blade units, and we'll talk about Free Blade units later. But essentially, you can stick that Canis Rex guy, or any other Free Blade for that matter, inside your battleforged detachment and uh, not lose your household tradition. Right, also, on the battlefield, knights gather in formations called lances, and if your army is battleforged, select one model in each Imperial Knight Super Heavy Detachment in your army, and each model you select gains the character keyword. This is the Knight Lances rule. So you've got three Super Heavy Imperial Knights, one of them becomes a character. However, the command benefit of each Imperial Knight Super Heavy Detachment is changed to none unless it contains any combination of at least three Questorus class or Dominus class units. So what this means is, if you take three of the big boys, you can get your three command points you get for the Super Heavy Detachment. If you take three Armager Warglaives, because Armager Warglaives are also Lords of War as well, they've got the big fist, that's their unit type. Lords of War, even though they're 12 wounds and, you know, uh, not as big as a, not as many wounds as a land raider, but they're still Lord of War detachments. So if you spam three Armager Warglaives for one super heavy detachment and three Armager Warglaives and three Armager, expecting to get lots and lots of command points, three command points every time, you're not going to get them. Um, 
Just to repeat, however, the command benefit of each Imperial Knight Super Heavy Detachment is changed as none, zero command points, unless it contains three of the big boys, the Questorus class and Dominus class units. You could bring a Super Heavy Detachment of three Armager Warglaives. You can do that. You're not going to get any command points for it. And one of them will become a character because you'll gain the character keyword because you'll have a Knight Lance, but you won't get any additional command points for it. For those command points, you need a super heavy detachment with at least three of the big boys in it. I think I've repeated myself enough. And you want an Imperial Knight character for two reasons. One is you can make heroic interventions, but two, if you have an Imperial Knight's character, you can make them your Warlord, and then you get your benefits of Warlord traits. So let's talk about Warlord traits. Let's go through the generic ones first. One, Cunning Commander. Once per battle, you can reroll one hit, one wound, one damage roll or saving throw made for your Warlord. In addition, if your army is battleforged, Gain a command point. Two, Iron Bulwark. Your Warlord has a four up invulnerable save against ranged weapons instead of the standard five up. I like it. Uh, three, add one to your Warlord's attacks characteristic. Four, add two to all advance and charge rolls made for friendly household units within six inches of your Warlord. And of course that would apply to your Warlord because he's within range for him of himself. So if you want to get big and stompy, that add two to advance and charge is actually quite good. Five, Choose one weapon, not a heirloom, so a relic, that your warlord is equipped with. Each time you make an unmodified wound roll of six for that weapon, the target suffers a mortal wound in addition to the normal damage. And six, fearsome reputation. Enemy units must subtract one from their leadership characteristics whilst they're within 12 inches of your warlord, and while they're within six inches of your warlord, subtract two from their leadership instead. And Canis Rex, um, the character thingy bob that we mentioned earlier, He's got that one, Fearsome Reputation. Let's run through the Household Warlord traits. Terran, you can reroll fail charge rolls for your Warlord. Griffith, Griffith, <laughs> immediately after your Warlord completes a charge move, choose one enemy unit within one inch. Roll a d6, and on a four up, that unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. Every time you make a charge roll, that's nice. That's a big impact hit. A Hawk Shroud at the start of your first battle round, but before the first turn begins, select one unit in your opponent's army and add one to hit rolls made for your Warlord against that unit. So you typically you'll be hitting on twos. Cadmus, reduce all damage suffered by your Warlord in the fight phase by one. Mortan, subtract one from hit rolls for attacks that target your Warlord at a range of more than 18 inches away. That one's pretty good. Raven, add one to saving throws made for your Warlord against attacks that have an AP characteristic of minus one. This does not affect invulnerable saving throws. Tyrannus, each time you make a wound roll of six up for your Warlord in the shooting phase, the AP characteristics of that intact is improved by one, e.g. AP zero becomes AP minus one. Crast, reroll hit rolls of one for your Warlord. Volker, reroll wound rolls of one, two, or three made for attacks against your Warlord. Wound rolls of one, two, or three. Made for attacks against your Warlord always fail, even if the attack has a strength characteristic higher than your Warlord's toughness characteristic. Whoa, that one's pretty good. Wound rolls of one, two, or three made for attacks. So that would be ranged attacks or melee attacks against your Warlord always fail. Wow, okay, that one's pretty good. Those are the Warlord traits. Then we have the Heirlooms of the Noble Houses, and there are four pages of relics and the first one immediately jumps out it's called sanctuary and your warlord has or well, the bearer of the relic has a five up and vulnerable save against range and melee weapons that's the kicker because you've always already got a five up and vulnerable save against range weapons right but having a five up and vulnerable save against melee weapons is very nice in an, these pages as well there's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten ten types of pimped weapons that you can get uh, i mentioned calls wrath i mentioned um some of the uh, um these pimped weapons in here such as endless fury the avenger gatling cannon that fires 14 times instead of 12 times i won't go through them all but as you can imagine they're pimped versions of the weapon that you can already get for your um uh imperial knight let's go through the other ones instead We've got Armour of the Sainted Ion. The Knight has a save characteristic of 2-up instead of 3-up. That one's pretty good. So already hard enough to wound Imperial Knights. And uh, that, one's, that one's pretty good. Um, 
Helm of the Nameless Warrior. Add one to hit rolls made for the wearer's attacks in the fight phase. Banner of Macar Macarius. Macarius. The legend that was Macarius. Solar Macarius. Or Mac Macarius. Triumphant. Uh, Questor Imperial class model only. So not the big ones. Uh, Imperialis Questorius. Questorius class. Not the Dominus class. Um, add one to leadership characteristics for friendly Imperium units within six inches of the bearer. In addition, if the bearer is within range of an objective marker, it controls that objective marker even if there are more enemy models within range of the same objective marker. If an enemy unit within range of the same objective marker has a similar ability, i.e. they control that objective marker um, as long as they're in range of it, uh, then the objective marker is controlled by the player who has the most models within range of it as normal. In this case, however, the bearer counts as 10 models. So it's objective secured for your Imperial Knight, and it counts as 10 models. That's pretty good. Uh, Mark of the Omnissiah. Um, Questor Mechanicus model only. Roll d6 at the start of your phase, and or at the start of your turn, and on a 6, regain d3 lost wounds. Any other result gains one loss wound. So you get one wound back a turn, and on a six, you're regaining d3. Uh, Helm Dominatus. So this is a Questori, Questoris Mechanicus and Questoris Class Dominus Class models only, so not armages. Once per battle round, at the start of either your shooting phase or fight phase, you can choose a unit from your opponent's army that is within 24 inches of the bearer. Until the end of the phase, add one to hit rolls for attacks made by an armager class model against that enemy unit while they're in six inches of the bearers. Okay, so you need an armager next to a big knight, and then that armager adds one to the hit rolls for attacks, as long as they're in range. Uh, Mark of the Lance, House Griffith, model only. Each time the bearer completes a charge move, choose an enemy unit within one inches, and roll a d6, and on a two up, the enemy suffers d3 mortal wounds on a Six, it suffers three mortal wounds. Angel's Grace, which is House Hawk Shroud. Roll a d6 each time the bearer suffers a mortal wound in your opponent's psychic phase, and on a four up, they don't. Hunter's Eye, House Cadmus model only. Enemy units do not receive the bonus for saving throws for cover against the bearer's range attacks. The Banner Involate. 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 Inviolate. That's how you pronounce that word. Inviolate. <laughs> Doing a lot of reading here. House Raven Questorius class model only. Reroll to hit rolls of one in the fight phase for House Raven models while they are within six inches of the bearer. The Headsman's Mark. House Crass model. Increase the damage characteristics of the bearer's weapons by one for attacks made against enemy units containing models with the wounds characteristics of ten or more. And two for attacks made against Titanic models. Increase damage by two. And the Auric Mask for House Volker, the opposing player must roll an extra d6 when taking moral t morale tests for a unit within 12 inches of the bearer and use the highest result. So the most simple ones in this list that kind of stand out for me is the Sanctuary, which is a 5 up and bun against ranged and melee, or the Armour of the Sainted Ion, which is a save characteristic of 2 up instead of 3 up. But I do like some of these weapons in here, and I think I've already mentioned the ones that I like. Right, if you take a free blade, so those are the household stuff, and those are the relics, blah blah blah. Uh, if, your battle, if your army is battle forged, then before the battle you can give one free blade model in each detachment qualities and burdens. So, qualities are good, burdens are bad, and you have to do this. <clears throat> Actually, it says you can give one free blade model in each detachment, qualities, and bot burden. So I guess you could choose not to. We need a fact on that one. You can give one. doesn't say you must give one. Um, the way the qualities works is you can either choose a single quality or roll 2d6 and get the random results uh, discarding a duplicate. So you can pick one or roll for two and get two qualities. And when it comes to the burdens... You can either pick two or roll for one. So, um, some of these qualities are very good. So, um, and Canis Rex, the name character in here, has the quality legendary hero and last 
of their line. So Legendary Hero is once per battle roll, you can reroll a single hit, wound, damage, charge, or saving throw for this free, free a blade. That's Legendary Hero. And last of their line qualities is reroll hit rolls of one for the free blades attacks against units containing 10 or more models. Uh, the other four of these qualities are Indomitable, Indomitable, add one to the free blades wounds and leadership's characteristics. So you're basically getting a knight up to 25 wounds. Peerless Warrior, when this quality is chosen or generated, roll a d6 and on a one to three, add two inches to this free blades move characteristic. On a four by to five, improve the weapon characteristic by one. And on a six, improve prove the ballistic characteristic by one. Uh, Mysterious Guardian, the free blade can perform a, a heroic intervention as if it was a character and basically move six inches instead of a three and sworn to a quest. Reroll hit rolls of one for this free blade when it targets an enemy warlord. If this free blade is within range of an objective marker, it controls that objective marker, even if there are more models within the range of the same, blah, 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 blah. same objective secured basically. Um, the burdens kind of suck. So the way the burden works is you've got to do a leadership test, right? And um, you roll a leadership test and Imperial Knights leadership rule nine. So if you get under your leadership test at the start of your turn, you're absolutely fine. And if you get equal or higher than your leadership test, then um, you apply the burden that turn. So here we go. For example, you could have applied two qualities to your dude. He's got two good qualities, which pimp your knight, which is very, very good. You have to pick a burden as well, or roll for a burden, or pick two. Every turn, roll a leadership. Try not to get a nine or more. If you get a nine or more, one of these burdens will apply for that turn until the start of your next turn. So exiled in shame. While this burden applies, the free blade cannot be affected by any stratagems, and this includes using a command reroll. Two, weary machine spirit. While this burden applies, half the number of wounds that the free blade has remaining for the purposes of determining what characteristics to use on their damage table. Three, haunted by failure. While this burden applies, reroll hit rolls of six for the free blade. Four, obsessed with vengeance. While this burden applies, the free blade can only sh target the nearest enemy visible unit and only declare a charge against the nearest enemy unit. Driven to slaughter. While this burden applies, the free blade cannot fall back and its ballistic skill is changed to a six up. And six, impetuous nature. Um, while this burden applies, every move the free blade makes must take it closer to the nearest enemy model unless it is already within an inch. And it must declare a charge against every enemy unit within 12 inches of it during your charge phase. So as you can see, those burdens suck. If you roll a nine or more, they're not great. But in return, you can get some very 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 good qualities so um, a bittersweet pill i guess if you did roll a nine or more at the start of one of your turns you could command point re-roll one of those dice to make sure the burden does not apply so how many times are, you, are those burdens going to kick in a game maybe once in an entire game and maybe with a command point re-roll you could knock it away don't know anyway i like it i, I do like them i think they're narrative I think they're fluffy. The qualities always kick in all the time. You don't have to roll for them. They're happening. So you can add one to the free blades, wounds and leads, leads characteristics. It just happens all the time. Or, um, you know, reroll hit rolls of one when you're attacking units containing 10 or more models. Great stuff, particularly when knights normally hit on threes. So it's, it's, it's good. And that reroll hit rolls of one last of their line. Remember Canis Rex does that and he hits on a two anyway. Um, yeah, when he's hitting 10 or more models, uh, if he's stomping on them, he's hitting on twos. If he's using his big fist of doom and not crushing people to death when then he's hitting on threes. Um, so 
Those are your burdens, those are your household thingamajigs, those are your warlord traits. We've talked about the new model, so let's dive into the stratagems because there's four pages of these as well, and some of them are really, really good. Um, you have got rotate iron shields in here, which is the same as in the Adeptus Mechanicus Codex, where there are knight, uh, where there are Imperial Knights available in, in there. Curiously enough, the Imperial Knights in the Mechanicus Codex are now more expensive than the Knights in this book, but um, when you take Admech, you would have taken them as a different detachment anyway. So you take your Admech detachment, jobs are good, get this book and take your Knight detachment from this book, and this would unlock the... Um, stratagems from this book which has rotate iron shield so get your four up uh, five up and vulnerable save to a four up and vulnerable save now talking about vulnerable save the very first one ion aegis so choose a dominus dominus class unit from your army that's one of the two new uh, knights with all the guns it can't move until the start of your next turn for any reason so it stands still right it costs you two command points then any imperium unit which is wholly within six inches of your knight, gets the ion shield save of five up and vulnerable. Two command points. It's narrative as hell. I like it. Noble Sacrifice basically allows you to blow up on a four up for two command points. You have to spend the two command points, but then you blow up um, on a four plus. So it's two command points for a 50-50 chance. Can't see people pulling that one off very much. One command point, Thunderstomp. Thunderstomp. Um, Immediately after fighting um, with your knight against an infantry or swarm unit, roll a dice and on a four up you do D3 mortal wounds. Um, we've got additional heirlooms and things like that. Pack hunt, this is quite nice. Use a stratagem after an armager warglaive from your army is charged. Until the end of the phase, you can re-roll failed charge rolls for friendly armager warglaives while they're within 12 inches of that model. So one of the warglaves goes bundling in and the others get reroll charge. It's only a command point. I like it. Um, full tilt. Use this stratagem in your charge, fa charge phase. Choose an Imperial Knight's vehicle, anyone. Uh, that advance this turn and you can charge, even though it advanced this turn. So we've already talked about some of the relics and some of the warlord traits and some of the qualities, not burdens, that can get your knight moving quicker, getting that reaper chainsword and that stompy stompy into range. This thing allows you to advance and charge at the same time. Remember House Tyran, uh, when determining whether they advance or charge, they roll an additional D6. So these guys are moving quick and probably spending these two command points and getting up there very, very quickly and getting all stompy stomp. Um, we have Devastating Reach, which allows you, this is good, okay? Because <laughs> technically, to attack something in close combat, you must be in base-to-base -base contact, right? So if you're an Imperial Knight and there's some dude six inches up in a ruin somewhere looking down at you going, nah, 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 and pulling faces, you can't hit him because you're not in base contact with that guy in a ruin that's six inches up because you're, yeah, you need to be in base contact. And Imperial Knights can't climb ruins. Monsters, creatures, vehicles can't go up ruins. Um, only infantry can. So this one is called Devastating Reach and it's cost a command point and basically you can smack someone on a ruin so long as they're within two inches horizontally of you and six inches vertically and I assume when they say six inches vertically they mean six inches of the base. So basically uh, two levels up is typically six inches vertically. Um, but you can't use your feet. You can't use your titanic feet. You have to use another attack, Reaper Chainsword, whatever it is. So people can't just stick their tongue out at you and blow raspberries when they're uh, two stories up in a ruin because you can spend a command point and smack them with devastating reach. Anyway, um, for one command point, you've got Chain Sweep. Use this strategy after fighting with an Imperial Knights model from your army that you've and you've got a Reaper Chainsword in your hand, then you roll a D6 for every enemy model within three inches of you. And on a six up, that enemy model's unit suffers a mortal wound. So if you're surrounded by bugs, that's a pretty good one. There could be 15, 16 models around you, spend a command point, roll a bunch of sixes, you're killing some more. Um, Valiant Last Stand for two command points. Um, 
When a Questor Imperialis model from your army is reduced to zero wounds, so you're dead, spend two command points. You can immediately shoot as if it were your shooting phase or fight as if it was your fight phase, but you have to assume that the model has one wound when determining which characteristics to use on the damage table. Um, Machine Spirit Resurgent. Use this stratagem at the start of any turn. Pick a Questor Mechanicus unit from your army. Until the end of the turn, use the top roll, row of the model's damage table regardless of how many wounds it has left. This costs one command point and this stratagem exists in the Adeptus Mechanicus book as well. Spend a command point, use the top profile. Nice. Uh, Sally, for Sally Forth, three command points, outflanking Imperial Knights. Brilliant. It does cost three command points, and you can only do it with a Questorius class or our Armager class knight. You can't do it with one of the big Dominus ones. But um, for three command points, um, you can send one of these guys to outflank the enemy instead of setting it up with the battlefield. And at the end of any of your movement phases, it can join the battle from any board edge, six inches in and nine inches away from enemy models. Uh, you can only use this stratagem once per battle. It does cost three command points. It is a bit pricey but uh having a imperial knight appear in your back passage is going to be very painful um then we're on to the house specific ones so we'll go through these uh, slayer of shadows for house mortan um use the strategy in your shooting phase before choosing a house mortan unit from your army to shoot with until the end of the phase it ignores all modifiers positive and negative when making its attacks when it shoots so there's a unit in front of you that's got minus one minus two to hit it you ignore all of that stuff. Glory in honor. House Terran, unit from your army, has fought in the fight phase. It can fight again. That costs three command points. Remember House Terran are the ones that are pretty quick. Three command points to fight again. That could be devastating. Um, even up against, I don't know, a Wraith Knight. Even up something that can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with an Imperial Knight. If you've charged and smacked it and you've taken the smack back, you hitting it again with a Reaper Chainsword or hitting something again twice. When you're an Imperial Knight, you can dish out a lot of damage. It does cost three command points there. House Raven. Um, at the start of your shooting phase, until the end of phase, re-roll all rolls of one for that model. This includes hit rolls, wound rolls, damage rolls, and rolls made to determine the number of shots fired by a weapon. That makes a random number of attacks. It's only re-rolling ones, but you re-roll everything. Rolling the hit, rolling the wound, rolling... Yeah. Two command points. Two command points for our, and that was the House Raven one, two command points for our Darkest Tower for House Tyrannus models. When it dies, you've got an Imperial Knight, it's reduced to zero wounds, so it's gone, but did not explode. And that's the important thing. <laughs> you haven't rolled that magic six. You spend two command points and you need to roll a four plus. So it's a 50-50 chance whether you pull it off. You need a four plus. But if you get a full plus, at the end of the turn, at the end of the phase, you can set it back up again as close as possible to its previous position, more than one inch away from enemies with the three wounds remaining. So because it happens at the end of the phase, say your opponent blows it a knight up earlier in the shooting phase, you don't then put it down and then your enemy can shoot it again. You take the knight away. The enemy com completes all of its shooting phase and then you can spend two command points on a 50-50 chance of getting a knight back with D3 wounds left. I would I think that one's worth two command points. I do. Particularly as it happens at the end of the phase. Uh, saturation Bombardment from House Volker. Um, in your shooting phase, before you choose a model um, from your army to shoot with, uh, use the strategy in the shooting phase before choosing a house Vulcan model from your army to shoot with until the end of the phase each unmodified hit roll of six for that model shooting attacks cause two hits instead of one so on a six two hits instead of one dragon slayer house griffith model from your army makes its attack in the shooting or fight phase until the end of the phase add one to wound rolls made for that model's models attacks against units uh, containing models with wounds characteristics of 10 or more models. So your health Griffith, you're fighting something big, 10 or more models. Add one to your wound rolls. Whether you shoot, punch it. That was two command points. One command point for controlled aggression um, for house crash units, and it's basically death to the false emperor. Um, three command points for bio scryer cogitator array for house cadmus. 
three command points. Use this stratagem immediately after your opponent sets up a unit arriving on the battlefield as reinforcements within 12 inches of a model from your army, a house cadmus model. So they've got to come in, they're deep striking in to do some nasty stuff. You can shoot it as if it were your shooting phase. It costs three command points. They've got to be close. But when you're shooting with an Imperial Knight, you can do some significant damage. And then Hawk Shroud, choose a friendly Hawk Shroud model. Um, when, well, when, after an enemy unit declares a charge against any Imperium unit from your army, uh, if you've got a Hawk Shroud model within 12 inches of the target of the charge, you can fire Overwatch. <laughs> so you're, you're playing Knights, their allies, you've got, I don't know, your custodies, your guardsmen, whatever. And that guard unit is getting charged by the enemy. You've got a knight 12 inches away. You can fire overwatch at that unit that's charging those guardsmen. Two command points. And you can make a heroic intervention as if you were a character. And you can move up to 2d6 inches. So you're not heroically intervening three inches. You roll two dice. If you get nice money, your knight can fire overwatch and go charging in. Um, yeah, it's nice. Two command points. Can't move within an inch of another enemy unit. It has to be to defend the unit that's getting charged and charge the unit that's charging the unit that's getting charged, if you get what I mean. You can't just suddenly roll your 2d6 and go flying off in another direction to hit a different enemy unit. Those are the stratagems. There are some Adriosis stratagems in there. I like it. I'm very interested to see how some of these come about. Uh, are used uh, rotate iron shields fighting on the top level of your bracket when you're damaged are good they're in the admec book for a reason they're in here for a reason but some of these like death grip that we spoke about earlier on just crushing and crushing some of the death the ability to spend three command points and outflank with your imperial knights is good i've missed out a couple of uh, there's about four or five that i missed out which are just very bleh I've, I've just talked about the really good ones, or not really good ones, the ones that are good enough to report to you guys. Um, yeah, being able to devastating reach for a command point, be able to smack someone who's up a, a level in a ruin is nice. Um, there's just, there's some nice command points in there. There's some nice stratagems in here. And when I think about some of the warlord traits, when I think about some of the relics, when I think about some of the overlapping stuff, I just have to say, I was very excited by this book. Um, last time I was excited, this excited by a book was, it was a while ago, Custodes, I was very excited by, but I am an Admech and Imperium player at heart. Space Marines were my first love, but I really like the Admech, uh, I really like the Imperial Knights. Who doesn't like playing with Imperial Knights? It is an awesome starter army. If you've got, um, an eight-year-old child running around, you know, a son or a daughter, and you want to get them into 40k, buy them giant stompy robots, because one, you only need a couple of them, two, it's solid, it's a solid book, you've got things in here that are going to make them more shooty, things in here that are going to make them more survivey, there's more options to take, they're a little bit cheaper, particularly the armages, um, yeah, it's a good book, I like it, but on that note, I'm going to have to shut up, because, um, I think this video is very long as it is. So thank you one more time for Games Workshop for sending it through to me. If you want to support me, you can support me on Patreon. To all my patrons, I will see you in the patron-only Discord chat rooms. And if you have any questions, fire away. I'll be happy to answer them. You can further support the channel if you want to or check out more Winter's SEO Battle Reports on DeploymentZone.tv. But that's it for this book. I like it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for Games Workshop. Happy Wargaming.